Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me here today to present our nemesis, Yumab, Him Libra. You may also hear me use the term ACE 910 as well. Um, I've got these two pictures of jigsaws, and it's just not just me playing around with PowerPoint. Um, this really is about piecing a jigsaw together, and, it, and it's that understanding of how our blood clots that led to the discovery and development of Him Libra. As somebody who's worked in the industry now for 23 years, it's very rare that something comes along that really may, makes you stand up and go, my word, that's a medicine, as soon as you see it. I hope I can demonstrate to you in the next 20 minutes or so why I had that level of excitement when we first took this um, project on. So a little quote that I want to share with you. Many of you have probably read Rachel Clark's book, Your Life in My Hands, about the travails of a junior doctor in the NHS. Um, but she discussed haemophilia at one stage, and, and I'll quote this verbatim. So bewildering is the infamous clotting cascade that generations of medical students have given up ever truly understanding it. And only a rare breed of doctor, an erudite subtype of haematologist known as a clotter, properly grasps the processes. But in real life, stopping a hemorrhage in a patient can make you want to whoop with the relief. And this is the clotting cascade. And, and as I said, there's no exam here. We won't be going through this um, as, a, as an exit interview or anything. But you can see this is a, this is a, a cascade of, of clotting factors and proteins, which leads to the insult, a hematoma, um, a cut, whatever it happens to be and link, leads down ultimately to the clotting of your blood and um, normal homeostasis. And there's a uh, common and extrinsic and intrinsic pathways. I'll go into a bit more detail on this, but if I can just get this um, to work. This is the, this is the area that, that we're gonna be concentrating on today. So hemophilia A. I'm, I'm sure there's very few people who don't know about haemophilia in here, uh, in the room. It's an X-linked recessive inheritance disorder, overwhelmingly in males. There are some female um, sufferers, particularly with haemophilia B, but it's very rare. And it's categorized as mild, moderate, and severe, and the clinical hallmark is bleeding. And you can see on the right-hand side these fairly graphic pictures of, of patients with joint bleeds, and they're, they're characterized by prolonged bleeding, but also spontaneous bleeds. And these are serious. Um, you can get deep, deep muscular bleeding, um, bleeding in mucous membranes, and also more life-threatening, such as intracranial, neck, throat, and GI bleeds as well. So it's not just uh, trying to prevent bleeding to give somebody um, uh, normal activity. It's also life-saving as well. There's a standard, there are standards of care, and I'm gonna talk about non-inhibitor and inhibitor here. So as I showed you earlier on with that um, clotting cascade, you can treat, uh, so haemophilia A is, is the loss of functional factor eight. And factor eight couples together with factors nine and 10 to move into the, the rest of the complex. So if a patient presents with haemophilia and they're what's called non-inhibitor, so effectively first line therapy, you can treat episodically with factor eight, so post-bleed, or you can treat prophylactically with factor eight. This factor eight is uh, administered every second day intravenously. Um, what happens in about up to 30% of patients, unfortunately, is that they develop inhibitors to that factor eight, so an immunogenic response, and then they're rendered that they, they can't be treated any longer. And again, there are alternatives where those patients can be treated with bypassing agents episodically or prophylactically. The um, treatment is either recombinant factor 7A or APCC, which is activated prothrombin complex. They're treated frequently. The infusion times are long. I mentioned a point here. Median ABR, I'll be coming back to this expression throughout the course of the, the, the lecture. ABR stands for annualized bleed rate, and it's the classic measurement of, of a treatment of a hemophilia patient. So what you can see on here is, is what I've just mentioned. There's factor nine and factor 10, um, coupled with factor eight, will lead to this 10 ACE complex and um, further progression through the clotting cascade. 
And this is how they couple together with factors 9a and factor 10 with factor 8. And, and as I said before, if factor 8 is absent, you can provide an artificial factor 8. In 2001, our colleagues in Chugai, which is a, a wholly owned affiliate of Roche in, in Tokyo, started to think about ways that they could design novel antibodies, building on the, the, the new concept of, of constitutional locking of bispecific antibodies. So the idea is that could you mimic um, the mechanism of factor eight with factors 9A and factor 10 to produce a bispecific antibody which, which reconstituted the clotting cascade. And this led to a real labor of love that they looked at over 40,000 combinations of, of different, different antibodies prior to piecing them all together and led to the discovery of ACE910, which stands for Antibody Mimicking Coagulation Factor 8 by Connecting Factors 9 and 10. What's really important is there's no structural homology with ACE910 or imicizumab as it came to be called with factor 8. That idea was deliberate because we wanted to reduce the possibility of inhibitors being raised against, against the ACE910 as well. So, this is uh, Hemlibra, Emicizumab, sorry, I'm going to keep <laughs> switching between the names. I always think of it as Hemlibra now because it's, because it's a marketed medicine. So, as you can see here, that bispecific antibody sits in that pocket between factor 9A and factor 10. Um, and what we saw was the non-clinical data showed complete control of bleeding in an acquired hemophilia model in the Sinomologus monkey. I'll show you some of that data now. So firstly, some of the in vitro data with, with um, ACE910. On the left-hand side, we see an effect on factor 10 activation, or fact, effect on factor 9A catalyzed factor 10 activation. I told you it was complex. Um, and you can see that as you increase the concentration of your bispecific antibody, you get the activation. And then using um, plasma, which is depleted of, uh, depleted of uh, factor VIII, and plus and minus inhibitors within that, within that plasma, you can see that as you increase the concentration of, of uh, HSP23, ACE910, you get a reduction in the um, pro, pro activated prothrombin time. Again, a classic measurement of, of um, hemostasis. In that non-clinical model, the synomologous model, what we see here on the left-hand side is um, a recapitulation of hemoglobin levels in the blood, uh, prevention in skin bruising in the, on the middle slide, and finally, which was really important for us, was a favorable PK profile. And when you take the predictions from the non-clinical data, it looked as though we were predicting a 25 to 30 day half-life of, of emicizumab in patients. And that's really important, remember, because I, I said about the frequency of administration in young children with intravenous administration that their parents would be hooking them up to IV infusions every second day, sometimes every day with, with, the, with the APCC as well. So giving patients their lives back as well in terms, of, in terms of their reliance on their medicine was something that was really important. And I'll come on to some of that work here. Now, the first volunteer was, was dosed in August 2012, and the first patient received emicizumab in May 2013. We received approval in inhibitor patients from FDA in November 2017, and in non-inhibitor patients in October 2018. So this went really fast. Um, just goes to show, I mean, again, something that I've noticed in, within industry is how helpful health authorities can be in terms of trying to develop novel medicines. And we really benefited from the relationships which we had with health authorities right across the world. So this is some of the multiple ascending dose data in haemophilia patients. So we looked in, we looked in healthy volunteers, then we moved where you could check the APTT time and then we moved into um, patients. There are three doses here, Q weekly being a, a once a weekly dose. On the left hand side, doses of 0.3, 1, and 3 milligrams per kilogram. And this is trough concentrations across, uh, going right out to almost two years. So you can see that the, the behavior of the drug is very, is, is, is very good. When you look at the, that APTT in the clinic, so this is the translatability from that Sino model, you can see that, that each of these doses, in particular the two higher doses, lead to this uh, full reduction in APTT, which is associated with normal hematostasis. 
Then we look at the annualized bleeding rate in those patients. And what you can see here is this is the, the historical control in gray, and we see a dose response. And this is when we started to get really excited. These patients were pretty much stopping bleeding as a consequence of, of being administered emicizumab in Libra. This is just a summary on the right-hand side with the rest of the numbers. So how do we select the dose? You saw those doses of, 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 uh, originally. Here you see an exposure-dependent reduction of bleeding events. So the red dots are bleeds within patients, and as their exposure goes up, you see that there's, the bleeding is prevented. And we took this information, and then we started to build models of time-to-event bleeds. Um, and the original estimates that were for a median annualized bleed rate, so 50% of patients or more having no bleeds at all, we predicted a trough concentration of around 45 micrograms per mil. This is unusual because actually, in my experience over the years, is, is that normally um, exposures required to produce full clinical outcome tend to increase as safety margins also decrease in, in the clinical setting. With emicizumab, they went down. We actually now estimate that you, don't, you probably need only around 30 micrograms per mil to, to get this full uh, control of bleeding. And from there, we set a dosing regimen with a loading dose. So patients are given three mg per kg four to, for four weeks, and then that's followed by FB, one mg per kg per week. And this simulation is just the, the, the exposure versus the time since the start of emicizumab. There was an option in the trials to also up titrate the dose if necessary. So don't try and take all the details in here, but this was the original clinical development plan. So we had the healthy volunteer study. We had a non-interventional study going on in, in inhibitor, non-inhibitor, and pediatric patients who acted as their own control. And then we went into four separate studies, all called HAVEN, HAVEN Hemophilia A, and I can't ever remember what the VEN part stands for. But these studies, uh, so the HAVEN 1 was in those inhibitor patients, those patients who, who had exhausted their option with factor VIII, who were the most severe, uh, most severe of the patient population. And that was for adolescents in excess of 12 years old. Haven 2 is a pediatric study. I won't go into too much detail on that um, today, but I'm happy to take questions on that. Um, suffice to say, it looked as good as everything else. Uh, and Haven 3 was the non-inhibitor patient population, which we used as a second round of approval. We wanted to get into those, those patients that had the greatest medical need first. So we prioritized the Haven 1 study. And finally, Haven 4 was effectively a confirmation of a pharmacokinetic study where we were looking at less frequent dosing. So bringing that dosing from one week right down to once every four weeks. We also did bleed medication questionnaires. There was a lot of quality of life questions in here. This is not just an advert for Samsung. Um, so really to see what patients preferred as well. I'm not gonna go into the subjective results here. I'm gonna concentrate on the bleed rates. One thing we were really proud of, because this data looks so good in those first multiple ascending doses, et cetera, we use simulation approaches on each of these different um, doses. So you can see the one and a half Q weekly, the, the three MIGs every second week, or the six MIGs every month um, were based upon a time to event model of annualized bleeding rate. What this meant is we never studied the three MIG per kg Q2 weekly or the six MIG per kg Q4 weekly prior to phase three. And we think as a consequence of that and taking that decision, we took about 18 months off the development time for those alternative formulations. So um, hopefully a lot of patients have benefited from, from that approach as well. Again, having great data means you can do great work with it, with it and predict in, into another scenario. So these are the results from the Haven 1. And this is the bleed rate versus bypassing agents, factor seven or, or APCC. What I really want you to do, look at here is this change in the median annualized bleed rate. This is the, um, this is the, the median in the RMB where patients had no prophylaxis and they were given the episodic uh, bypassing agents. And you can see this 87% reduction in bleeds with, hem, uh, with emicizumab compared to that standard of care. What's also noteworthy is the median annualized bleed rate is zero. Indeed, 63% of patients had no bleeds at all. No participants discontinued due to lack of efficacy. When we look at the secondary endpoint as well um, on the bleed rate, we see the same thing with prior 
uh, prophylaxis versus emicizumab prophylaxis. Again, a median ABR of, of zero. 70% of patients demonstrate no bleeds at all. So um, not surprisingly, we were ecstatic to see this, to see this data and went for rapid uh, accelerated approval with FDA, EMA, et cetera, et cetera. This slide's quite busy. And this is Haven 3. This is the non-inhibitor patient population. Um, rather than going through all the data on the left-hand side, I think the visual of the figure tells you all you need to know. That the doses of emicizumab either Q weekly or Q2 weekly led to 96 or 97 percent reduction in the annualized bleed rate. And what was really interesting, because we also compared to historical data with factor eight, and you see a 70 percent reduction in annualized bleed rate with emicizumab over infusing factor eight. So we not only show that you can administer less frequently than the standard of care, but you're getting a, a really remarkable improvement in the um, control of bleeding in these hemophilia patients. This is the median ABR. It's a bit of a slight build here, so you can see these patients with zero bleed rates, again, at 50, 55, 60%. And with zero to three bleeds, we're right down, uh, we're right up at 91 to 95% of patients. In terms of the pharmacokinetics, um, this is a, an amalgamation of all four trials, Haven 1 to 4. And what you can see is, is that hemocysiumab is very well behaved pharmacokinetically. You reach your trough concentrations and there's very little variability as a consequence of that. Um, the Q4 weekly data shows the same level of bleed control as, as the Q2 weekly and Q weekly. And now it tends to be a, a physician and patient preference to go with a once monthly administration. So we've changed from once a day, twice a day intravenous infusions to a once monthly subcutaneous in, uh, injection. Um, I don't want this to be a sales pitch at all, but it's, uh, you know, it's really, it's very gratifying to see this sort of, this sort of change in terms of, uh, of treatment options for patients. Safety, of course, is extremely important. Now, those of you who have looked at the hemolibra drug label will notice there is a black box warning. And it's based upon uh, two acronyms which I'll explain here, thromboembolic microangiopathy, TMA, and thromboembolism. And this was something which we, we thought could occur and is due to, um, predominantly to, to making sure that we have very clear advice on practice here. Because if you, uh, patients who, who demonstrated thromboembolism or uh, TMA had received um, large doses of the prothrombin complex concentrate at the same time. So if you imagine you've got two sets of, 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 of non-competing anti-hemophilic um, administrations going on at the same time, you can effectively push up your um, throm, uh, thrombotic capacity and, and lead to thrombosis. So we recommend in the label very clear that, that the bypassing agents should be discontinued before starting in Himmler, Hemlibra. And if APC is indicating a patient who has had a bleed, um, the additional dose should not exceed 50 mag, uh, units per kilogram in the first 24 hours of treatment. Apart from that, the medicine is, is very well tolerated and the non-inhibited patient population there's, there's very limited in terms of um, safety risks, et cetera. So um, we like to think that this is a well tolerated and efficacious medicine. What I really wanted to show you was because, you know, one of the things that's really important here is, is I presented on factor eight where patients develop antibodies. So those in the, there could be people in the audience say, yeah, well, it might work for a little while, but then the patients are going to develop antibodies and you're going to be giving them something else as well. Um, so we followed the patients out. And over the next three slides, I'm just going to show what this looks like um, going out to two, three, four years, I think, in, in, in some respects. But this data is really gratifying to see that, that um, what I'm showing you here is patients with zero or one, one to three bleeds. Now, the, um, yeah, they, they don't come out on my monitor. They're perfectly clear on, on the slide above. But what you can see that in contrast to the potential for actually for the efficacy of the drug to wear off with time, it's actually improving. Um, and you can see that those patients with, with zero bleeds or just one to three bleeds annually are increasing with time. 
We see low, blunt, low spontaneous bleed rates as well. This has been maintained with long-term emicizumab prophylaxis. Um, draw your attention to the right-hand side, the proportion of bleeds with zero or one to three spontaneous bleeds over time in 400 patients is up in the high 80s and 90%. Finally, um, I'll let the numbers talk for themselves. But what we've seen over these uh, four to 500 patients now is that 99.2% of target joints, so those joints where bleeds were occurring, have been resolved. Um, so I'd like to leave you with this slide about um, demonstrating how a good understanding of, of antibody design, a good understanding of, a, of a, a very clear system for control of bleeding within the patient, and then some exquisite protein chemistry to uh, specifically target a, a, a means of, of giving a novel way of, of treating this condition can lead to clinical responses which are, which are as good as this. Finally, this is the most important point. We couldn't have done this without the caregivers, the patients, and the patients' families as well, who trusted us to investigate in him, him libra in themselves and in their loved ones. And without them, we would have never made this medicine a marketed product. So I want to thank everybody who was involved in the development of him libra. And with that, if there's time for questions, I'd be delighted to take some. Thank you, Alex. Any questions from the audience? There's one over here. Hello. Um, very nice talk. I have just a question about the dosage. So you said that Henry Bra is given in units per kilogram, and I'm just wondering what the units are. Ah. Um, the, it's, it's actually the APCC which is given in units per kilogram. Hemolibra is dosed milligrams per kilogram. Um, and the reason that the APCC is units per kilogram is because it's a complex, it's, it's extracted from, uh, normally it's a porcine extract, and they don't actually fully know what's in there, so they just use a unit uh, value. But for Hemolibra, it's most definitely mixed per kick. Any other questions? There's one over here. Thanks. Um, a fa fascinating talk. Well done. Congratulations. Has it been a tried outside of haemophilia for other bleeding diathesis? Could it have any other indications? Wow, that's a good question. Um, and one without a simple answer. No, we haven't so far. Um, we haven't looked outside. The, the, the program's actually still ongoing because we, we're, ne we're now looking at really young kids as well, even though we have approval. Um, we want to generate clinical data in you know, patients who may be diagnosed pre-birth with haemophilia and, and how we control there. So our efforts have been really on, on um, getting the sort of cradle to grave control with haemolibra. We haven't looked at other indications yet, though. Thank you very much. It's a really nice presentation. I, I mean, you, you talked about the number of antibodies that were rejected during the process. I mean, what made that one special, was it? <laughs> Do you know what? I don't know. Um, I've, I've had the pleasure, actually, to have dinner with the guys who discovered Heem Libra, and they're the most humble people you'd ever meet. Um, and, and they just had a, a labor of love. This was all, it was just about that constitutional locking uh, so they, had, they, they found plenty of antibodies which would, would produce some level of clotting, but there were risks about the immunogenicity side. Um, I think there was also the, a, a question of, of structurally whether you, could man, you think you could um, achievably manufacture as well. So it was multi-component or multifaceted in terms of how it was selected. I don't know whether there could have been six or seven others which could just as easily have, have been... Um, have been developed. I do know clearly that the, the, the way that research worked on this, because it was eight years from um, inception to the design of, uh, conception, sorry, to the design of, of ACE 910, that they were very dogged 
and very demanding in terms of, of what they accepted. So, so, so did they have a, an, an in silico model of the kind of docking that would be required? Or yes. It, yeah. Yes, they did. We've got time for one more question, if anyone's got one. OK, one from me. What next for Omi Susie Mab then? Well, Helen, I, I mentioned a little bit about that. But, well, firstly, we're following patients out still. Um, we now have a China filing ongoing as well. Um, the, the results of that have just, well, we've seen the results now. We're, we're looking towards filing in, in um, um, February next year. And we also are expanding this, this uh, pediatric indication because whilst we've got an approval, there are many pediatric hematologists who say, well, you know, you've, you've got approval based upon simulations. You've got a few pediatric patients who are under the age of two. We need more data because this is a, this is a big area. Hemophiliacs historically have been very poorly served by the community. You think about things like contaminated blood back in the 1980s, et cetera. So switching treatments when, when your son or as a person is stabilized on, on this treatment is very difficult to do and entirely understandable that that should be the case. So in terms of helping um, physicians to change their practice, we are, we are working at the moment on a, on a very young patient population. That trial will start, uh, we hope, April to May next year. Um, so again, it, it's continuing to provide information to caregivers to, to enable them to confidently dose whatever status of the patient. Okay. Thanks very much, Alex. Thank you.